So as I said, week nine, it's incredible. This week we're going on muscular, skeletal, or articular dysfunction and neuromuscular or muscular dysfunction. That's where we go into the dystrophies and we go into fracture sprains, et cetera. Um, and I've got some great pictures in this PowerPoint. And of course, to follow, we do have our cahoots, which goes over and gives you an instant testing on the information that I'm talking about. Um, we have that Kaplan math is due. It is that Kaplan advanced math A. So if you're wondering, um, I'm also going to tell you, I am not going to check it until I do Kaplan A, B, and C. So I will not be checking it till those are handed in, which is actually a week 11. Now, I need nothing from you. You don't have to send me a screenshot. I have to go into every student. So the way it happens, I have to go into the campus, go into each student, and to look at all of your the work that's been done, and then to make sure that it's been remediated. Remember, even correct questions must be remediated. So if you get 100 and there's 10 questions, there has to be at least minimum 10 minutes of remediation, one to two minutes per question. I don't ask for anything crazy, okay? Um, but we feel that even doing the correct answers is really going to reinforce if you knew that information. And if you had a guess, then maybe this will tell you why your guess was correct. OK, so that's why we do it that way. We feel it is more beneficial like that. So um, the projects were turned in, as I was saying earlier, I really appreciated them. I've had a lot of fun watching them, looking at them, reading them. Again, I am going to be correcting them most likely by tomorrow, Wednesday at the latest. Remember, I've got three classes, so there's a lot of them, but I've kept up with them fairly good, if you've noticed. Some of them, you already have grades, so I've really tried to keep on top of them, getting them back to you so that you can make corrections. You still can, up till Sunday, next Sunday, make corrections, and I still can give you some points back. If you're doing what I told you to do, you didn't do this, you didn't put a reference here, you didn't, um, you know, whatever, okay, or the assessment, I didn't like, no um, respiratory, no problems. Well, tell me what the lungs sound like, because you do have lungs, cardiac, no issues, no. Tell me, what does it sound like, any murmurs, any gallops, etc. regular beat, irregular beat. That's what I wanna see, that you do know what you're listening for. It could be normal, but tell me what the normal is, okay? And remember your assessment um, and those, and, and it's been really good that those assessments do match the diagnosis that you've given me. And I do give you little hints and send it back. So go back and read your comments. You know, everybody has some sort of comment written on your project. So thank you for doing such a great job. So let's go ahead and start with your PowerPoint. Um, you do have these. I did send them out on Sunday. So, you know, you do have them. Remember, next week is your exam. And I am doing a review on Friday at 2 p.m. The first one is on Wednesday at uh, 6 p.m. by Professor Morris. And then there is one on Saturday evening at 6 p.m by uh, Professor Okorafor. So I will give you all those recordings. And again, I will keep it on the same page. So you're not looking for three different announcements. I also will put the cahoots, I will attach them to the recording. So you'll have it in one place what you can review, okay? Try to make it as easy I can for you, okay? Immobilized children. Well, does it matter if you're immobilized or if you're a child or an adult? Not really. Um, we know that uh, immobilization creates a lot of problems. Now, a child, some of them are born with congenital defects and they will be immobilized. That they're not gonna be able to walk, you know, whether they've had um, some sort of problem with their spinal cord, you know, they're paraplegics or they have bone disorders. A lot of these things, um, our children are born with, and we're going to go into some of those to let you know. And we know that there are some sort of conditions that are degenerative, and I'm going to go into some of those too. 
with the mobilization, just like we treat the adults, we're going to treat the children, you know, making their lungs, keeping those open and preventing, you know, atelectasis and pulmonary embolus and deep vein thrombosis, all those things. We're going to do the same thing for children that we do for adults. So we know if you don't use muscles, they're going to atrophy just like adults, so do children. So we do do physical therapy and occupational therapy for these children if it's warranted. There are some conditions you can't, which again, we'll go into, but we do want to try to keep those muscles moving. We're going to try to keep that skeletal system, you know, with good nutrition, keeping it, you know, very solid and not, not brittle. And our, of course, our heart cardiovascular system, making sure that we're not going to have, as I said, pulmonary embolises and edemas and, and all of those things. Now, a child. What about a child who can't move around? What if they are just in bed? Um, hopefully, and we do try on many of our children to get them up out of bed in a wheelchair. And even if they just have a little mobility in their hand, we give these children electric wheelchairs when they're able to be able to move around. You know, working in a pediatric hospital and we would see these children, you know, that are, let's say, paralyzed from the waist down due to myelomeningocele, spina bifida and those, these children, they are going down the halls and they're going beep, beep, beep and move out of the way because they're coming zooming down with their wheelchairs. And it just makes me smile because these children have mobility. Remember if they're in bed, can you imagine a child in bed and unable to get around and see what's happening around them? You know how inquisitive children are. So we need to get these children to feel that just because they're in bed and they're immobile, they're still a part of the environment, giving them things to do, you know, giving them, you know, TVs and, and games and having people come and sit with them and play games. And there's just so many uh, things available to the pediatric world. You know, I have mentioned child life before and child life is, uh, I first met them, I think it was in 2010 when they first got introduced into my hospital. And I didn't understand what they were at first. But as I started working with them, I realized that these people go and sit with children and show them you know, the equipment and stuff that we're gonna do to them. And then actually just sit there and play with them. And what if it's their birthday? Well, Child Life will come with presents and sing birthday and do all neat things for them so they don't feel like they're just so put in the corner. Now, what about the family? You've got a family connected to a child always, okay? It's not just a patient, it's a whole family because it is family-centered. So if a parent constantly has to go into the hospital because their child is immobile, or if the child's home in a mobile and can't get around that much, it does stop that family from moving around and doing things as much as they could because of that child. So families, parents, all of them, you know, need some sort of um, emotional help for that also. So they do have, and, and I've seen it in, in the hospital I worked at, they have these parent groups. I've seen it for your seizure kids, for your kidney kids, the cardiac kids. They get together and talk and talk about their frustrations and talk about issues they've been having and how they have conquered them. So it's a good thing. Now let's get into traumatic injuries. Well, you think of trauma, I think of sprains. And I think of being like this kid kicked in the shin playing soccer or kicking a kid in the shin with a foot and have my toe, you know, bruised and dislocated because it did happen. So there are contusions and contusions in themselves is not, you know, a big thing, but just think about the size of these contusions and then put other conditions into that. And it can be more than just a little black and blue, a little echematic area can become more than. So remember, a contusion is that escape of blood into underneath the skin and it causes that discoloration. It causes swelling and pain. With crush injuries, remember, it's just not the bruising, there could be swelling. So how do we as nurses take care of contusions? Remember to always check neurovascular signs and always to check pulses because that swelling could occlude blood flow and then you could have occluded blood flow going to the toes or to the fingers, you know, and this in itself could cause other problems. 
dislocations, like I just said, I dislocated my toe kicking a, a kid in uh, soccer um, in high school. So dislocations can occur. Now, I think probably the most common dislocation is that nurse maid's elbow in children. Ever have a little kid, three years old, you like to swing around with the arms and swing them around. and They go, wee, more, more, do it again, do it again, right? Well, sometimes the elbow can dislocate because, you know, the tens or tendons are still so weak and they're not, you know, as strong. So um, we just have to pop it back into shape and they do okay. Now, Downs children, have you ever seen a Downs child being able to lay, sit down and then put their face and their uh, bellies right on the floor sitting? They have such, such flexibility. The problem with these Downs children, they're so flexible and like sitting down, spreading their legs and then laying on the floor, they can dislocate their hips. So when we dislocate, we are mostly concerned about blood flow. So again, neurovascular signs, checking pulses. Now sprains are when you do trauma to the ligament. Um, I know that playing sports, you could run around the bases and hit the side and your, your uh, ankle goes and it, you could actually feel it rip. You know, I in high school and in, in uh, college played almost every sport. And I think the worst sport for sprains for me was volleyball. Go up, spike a ball, come down and land right on your ankle. And then it swells up and um, you get all that swelling in there. Now, Sprains, I think, are worse than a break because sprains, you just have to give it time to uh, relax. And, and what is a treatment? Well, we're going to go into that's rice, which is rest, ice, contain it, and elevate it. So that when you have strains, sprains are all what we need to do. Strains is when you um, use something um, and it's overused and sometimes you get these strains. And again, it again takes this rice and it takes some rest. So as I said, how do we take care of all these soft tissue injuries? Well, number one, you're gonna do neurovascular signs. You're gonna check for pulses. Make sure that all of that's flowing because you need that blood flow. You're going to rest it, you're gonna ice it, and you're going to um, put a, some sort of compression bandage ace bandages, you know, and then if you have ankle braces or knee braces, whatever, um, if you have them and then elevate it. And that helps keep that swelling down. I know as I went up for the ball, came down and I did it more than once. And it was every year that I played volleyball, I would always get a sprained ankle. As soon as it happened, I'd put my foot straight up in the air because I knew my ankle was gonna blow up. Today, what they do is they put little casts, little splints on to hold that injury. And they feel that that heals it better. Now, I've told you about those soft tissue injuries. Now, let's just talk about fractures. You know, children, you know, they're always trying to do things that they shouldn't. Um, or they get these new toys that are dangerous and don't have proper protective equipment. And if you see this boy sitting right there, bilateral fractured wrist, it looks like, right? You know, those little hovercraft things that came out a couple of years back, came back for Christmas. And I had two boys come in. They were nine and 11, I believe. Came in bilateral fractured wrists. When both your radial and, and your ulnar were both broken. And it was because they were on hovercrafts and they didn't have wrist braces on or even helmets. And they fell down and you put your hands down first. That's why those arms are usually the most common of all breaks, breaks because you put your hands out to support yourself if you're going to fall. Um, bikes can cause these and um, sports injuries for sure. Now, fractures in infants is extremely rare. If you look at the bones in infants, they're very soft and malleable. It takes a lot to break them. So if an infant has a fracture somewhere, you need to investigate. I've seen a three month old come in with a fractured skull, okay? So I was thinking, how did this occur? So when I picked that infant up out of the mother's arms to weigh it in triage, my fingers went into the skull and I went, okay, there's a fracture and the kid cried. So I immediately told the physician, we took the kid, I took the kid myself right over to x-ray 
did an x-ray of the scalp. And then he told me if, if it's broken, do a body gram, which means do a x-ray of the whole body, which little infants can fit right on top of a whole x-ray film. We found a fractured humerus, fractured ribs, and a fractured femur on a three-month-old infant. He was a twin. We brought the twin in, of course, DCF's called, because why do we worry about, you know, infants and these fractures and seeing they're all over the place and they're at different levels of healing. So this has been going on a while. Now, our job as nurses is, yeah, we can reach out and want to hit the mother, the father, uh, yell at them, but that's not our job. Our job is to protect your infant, to protect your child, making sure that they get the best care. So... Um, we did call DCF that came in. We called the other infant in, um, another uh, twin boy, his twin, same injuries. And then we called in the two-year-old brother and he was walking around on a fractured femur with all of the same injuries, fractured ribs, et cetera. Well, the end of it was, is the mother had to work multiple jobs. The father lost his job. So the mother was out working and the dad was taking care of the kids and they were just crying too much. So in the bathtub, he picked the kids up and slammed against the surround. That's why the fractured, you know, skull and, you know, the other fractures. Well, you know, that man is no longer, you know, free. Um, and these children were protected. And that's the bottom line. Protect your children. You know, infants with fractures is not normal. Okay. Now, there are different sort of fractures. It could be that simple or closed. That's the normal one where you fall down and you see swelling in the wrist and you know you've got a fracture. Well, then there's that open. We also call it compound. That means you can see the bone coming out through the skin. This is the one that we are concerned about infection and osteomyelitis. So this one does require IV antibiotics. So that child will be admitted, they will fix the bone, put a cast on it, or maybe you know um, an external device, something to help um, heal it. And of course the IV antibiotics are needed to prevent you know, infection. Then there's complicated ones that, you know, let's say fractured ribs goes in and punctures lungs. That would be a complicated. And then comminuted where there's, you know, basically splinters of um, types of bones like in the round into the tissue. Could be a femur, could be an arm. It doesn't matter. Now, children are growing. They're always growing. So there are what we call growth plate injuries. And you could see them on the bottom. They're last, you know, they are classified one to five. And this is what we call the epiphyseal plate is a growth plate. Now fractures in this area are extremely important that we fix them and we fix them accurately so that you don't get a crooked arm, a crooked leg. You want that growth to still continue in the proper way. You know, we don't want it to be crooked. So these types of fractures require surgery, an open reduction internal fixation, because we want that bone to grow straight so that we don't have a crooked leg or a shorter leg or a shorter arm than the other. Now, the one surprising thing is children heal very quickly. Now, infants, two to three weeks, they can fracture, they can fracture something and they can be healed. I mean, that's how quick they heal. Usually those children, you know, when we talk about those children, you know, two to six, that area, that might be one month, you know, that they only need a cast on. As you get older, you need more and more time. And you can see adolescents are eight to 12 weeks because the bones are more brittle. They take longer to form, you know, that little callus to hold that bone uh, straight. But the younger kids heal a lot quicker. So you get a kid and they have a fractured arm, you know, and they say, oh, he fell off the monkey bars. Always, if you can, get that child alone and ask him what they did. And all you're doing is protecting the child. You know, if we catch one out of a hundred, at least we've protected the one child who needed to be protected. So um, children usually will tell you the truth. They are the most truthful people when you get them alone and you've built up that rapport with them. So we get a suspicion. We see some, you know, swelling, some bruising. Okay, we're going to do an x-ray. 
Of course, we'll do the history. We'll try to, you know, do the child separately from the parents who brought them. And then we know if a kid will not put weight on the leg, we know that probably is a fracture. So how do we manage this? Well, we want to restore the function to the arm, to the leg, to the finger, to the toe, doesn't matter, and prevent those deformities. So we want to put it back in place and immobilize it, whether it's through some splint or from casting. Now, put a cast on an arm and it's not over yet. Now, yes, this arm down here on the right is like the extreme to everything, but you, my point here is making sure that we teach the parents if there's swelling, if the fingers get white, you know, if there's, you know, numbness, pain that doesn't go away, um, there's something going on like a compartmental syndrome so that we need to have that cast looked at. So pain, point of tenderness, pallor, pulselessness, paresthesia, paralysis, pressure. These are things we as nurses must check and also teach your parents any of these problems to get back to the physician. So castings today are a little different than yesterday, you know, yesteryear. It used to be all white casts for everybody and everybody got a white cast. Well, today they make kids stuff a little bit more fun. You know, I've seen children put their favorite sports team colors, or if it's Christmas, they have red and green, or if it's Thanksgiving, maybe orange, you know, Halloween, you know, they do different color casting. And, you know, it takes that scariness away from it. And it lets the children sort of enjoy their cast if they have to have it. Now, once they have a cast, parents and children must be taught how to manage them. Now, Many children, especially younger children that has just a fractured arm with a cast on it, they tend to forget they have that cast on, get back home and go run and jump in the pool. Now, a wet cast is dangerous because it can have algae and, you know, bacteria growing there. So we must change the cast if it's wet. So teaching those children, they're given bags for showers or hold their arm out during a shower or bath. And then of course there is, how do we take care of the skin? You know, the cool um, hair dryer and nothing inside because you can scratch inside, get a, a scratch, get infected, and then of course have some more problems. Now, sometimes a cast doesn't work and we have to use something else. Now we've heard of Buck's traction and fractured hips, right? With the adults, where it just pulls a leg down and it keeps that fracture, you know, from irritating inside that hip joint. Well, many times in children, we use this for fractured femurs because those femur bones tend to, the muscles tend to squeeze it. And then the edges with really sharp tend to go right, right into nerves and into muscles, causing a lot of pain. We put that traction and pull it with weights and we can get that bone straight so that that little sharp edges aren't into, you know, the areas which causes a lot of pain until we can get the surgery done. And then, you know, we do the put the rod in and then the child, you know, is OK. Now, how do we take care of a fracture like this? Well, if you notice, there's a little rope on that rope is a little pulley and there's a weight. That weight must always be on, must always be hanging. You must document every 12 hours what the weight is and that it's free hanging. You never take it off to bathe. You never take it off for nighttime, no, because those muscles will spasm and those bones will go right out into the muscles and nerves again and cause a lot of pain. So um, fractures with um, traction, um, making sure that we check neurovascular signs because it's a fracture, usually that fractured femur, checking for neurovascular pulses and then keeping those weights free hanging. So as I said, the purpose is to keep those muscles relaxed, keeping from pain. Um, and it's mostly that muscle spasms. I've seen it used for fractured necks um, where they put the tongs in and I've seen um, different, you know, these immobilizing devices that we can. Now, these are all your different sort of tractions. We have Bryant, we have Bucks, we have Russells. Again, these are used for, you know, have a hip joints, you know, you have the Bryant's with the hip joints, you know, are out. So it's one way to do it. If 
um, casting isn't working. And then of course, I've talked about the brain. And then we have those cervical, those external devices that holds the necks uh, straight. So external devices, external fixation devices are used for many reasons. Now, sometimes children are born with a shorter leg, a shorter arm, and they want that arm to catch up. They can actually break the bone and put these devices on and it makes those areas longer. So external devices, they have pins, metal pins going into the bones. All we need to do is check that those pin sites, make sure they're free from infections, do pin care, you know, and um, just follow the routine, whatever their pin care routine is. Now, children can be born and they are missing something and require or already came with, you know, they don't have a leg or an arm. I knew a friend whose daughter was born without a um, fibula. OK, so if you don't have a fibula in your lower leg, there is no bone to support. You have tibia and fibula. There was nothing there. So they had to do a below the knee amputation. Um, they haven't figured out anything better to do yet. Um, sometimes they're born with none. Now, children are resilient. Children can have these a prosthesis. They can work well and they'll be running around with their you know, prosthesis and chasing other kids with their leg. And uh, that actually happened to my children with this little girl when I met her. Now, sometimes we have to amputate due to infection or something. Remember, it's just like adults, you know, they are gonna have that phantom pain. They are going to go through that process of, you know, making sure that we get that stump in a uh, way that it is workable, that we do put prosthesis and try to get them back to activities as much as they can. Now, children love to play sports. They are extremely competitive and they really wanna try really hard to win. So they really push their bodies. Many children don't get out and warm up. So of course, you're gonna see that they have those um, type of injuries just because they didn't do those stretches. There's also overuse syndromes. Um, children, even going into adolescence, they tend to train longer and harder because they want to succeed at something, whether it's like the Olympics and gymnastics, or, you know, this is a child who's good at track, so we just run more than, you know, we should, and we can cause a, a lot of um, stress fractures, tendons being pulled, and these what micro uh, traumas can occur. Infants at birth can be born and their hips can be out of joint. It could be, should be in that ball and socket, but sometimes it goes up. So if that leg is not, that hip joint is not where it should be from the femur, okay, and it goes up, what are you going to see? Now, you have girls, or mostly. So if that hip joint, ball and socket is higher than the hip, we know we're going to see a short leg for sure. If you turn them on their back, you're going to see the gluteal fold. One's going to be higher than the other. You are going to see positive ortolani and a positive Barlow results with these things. This way, when you go into the pediatrician first visit, he takes the knees and go up and down and sideways, and he's listening for clicks, and he's seeing if those joints are in uh, where they should be. Now, what happens if they find that you have this hip dislocation and we need to put it back in the hip ball socket, go back where it should? Well, as I said, infants heal extremely quick. So what they do is they put this pavlic harness on and you can see it right here. So we put a shirt underneath because we don't want that rubbing and we have the diaper free. We can change it as much as we want and it's on for 23 hours a day. We take it off for bathing only. And usually within six months, it's back in and sometimes a lot quicker. Sometimes the hip dislocation was minor and you didn't see it at first, but the longer you wait, the more solid and solidified those muscles get and it's harder to get back in. So 
that one might need surgery and a spica cast, or as they're older, they might have to go in there and cut those tendons to loosen it to get those hips back where they should be. Club foot. Now you don't need to know all the names and the different types of them. All you need to know with club foot is that there is a deformity of the foot and the ankle. So we need to get those club feet back where they should be. Jasmine, did you have a question? Um, so my son had a dislocated hip when he was born, um, a, a birth, I guess, deformity. Yeah. And he had to be in the public harness, but he also had a club foot wow. uh, when he came out too. So is that normal that they would have, they could have both or... Is it like usually you get one or the other? Um, I've never seen both together, but, you know, infants, you know, children, they, they do the craziest things. Um, it's just getting those deformities put back together as well as we can is, is the most important thing. So he was in a Pavlik harness and did you do the serial casting? Um, For the so club foot. Oh yeah, he had a little um, splint. Oh, they it put was a, a little splint. splint. Yes, they put a splint on him. Um, I could show you. I could send you a picture and show you exactly because I mean oh, it I'd was really, it. really, it was really, really cool. Actually, I mean, um, it was a hassle to clean because it's mostly fabric, mm -hmm. but um, and it's white too, so it makes mm -hmm. it even worse. <laughs> yes, but is. but um, I mean, but other than that, like I mean. It was more of, I think he had his on for only like three months though. And then they were like, he's done. He yeah, didn't have to have his on. Some of them are so quick because as I said, infants are flexible and they t their muscles and tendons tend to move easier than the older children. So when you have a club foot, usually what is used is this serial casting, which is called Ponsetti method. And what they do is that every week, they change this cast so that they're constantly putting his foot back into position. So, and this requires extremely close observation. So every week we go back and we check it and we put it, you know, back together. I've actually seen infants get these casts put on on a Friday and the parents come in on Saturday and they have a cast in one hand and the child in the other. How they got out, I'm not sure um, because it doesn't seem the possibility, but as I said, infants are just so special that that happens. Now, the one thing about club feet, you know, and even that hip dysplasia, as Jasmine was saying, is that there is um, follow-up that's required, making sure that the feet and the hip and everything stay in position, you know, as they go on and get older, just to make sure, just checkups, um, until they get older and up and walking um, to prevent any issues. Now, I mentioned one of those conditions that you really can't do physical therapy, occupational therapy on, and that condition is called osteogenesis imperfecta, or we call it OI. And this is also called brittle bone disease. You could pick a child up and just touch ribs and they could crack. That's how brittle these bones are. Extremely difficult as a nurse to deal with, to take care of, because you're always afraid you're gonna break a bone. And no matter how careful you are, you're going to see, you know, these bones do break. Now, the concern is with osteogenesis imperfecta is if these breaks get these children in a position that they can't get into a wheelchair and be able to be mobile. Because even though they have all these fractures and they're very weak, they might have a little finger on a hand, even if the wrist was fractured, to be able to get around in a wheelchair. They do intravenous 5-phosphonate therapy, and they give vitamin D, and they give calcium and all those things, but there's really no cure for this. Again, we need to keep those um, fractures in a position where, you know, at least they can be able to get around, like these kids in the bottom, because these were all OI kids that I saw. Leg calf birth disease is an aseptic necrosis of a femoral head. So there's no reason for it. 
there is this femoral head um, just get starts to get necrotic and um, the children, it's hard to diagnose. Now, usually what we see is all of a sudden the child starts to limp. He starts to have pain and it gets progressive. And it's of course, even more in the morning because it's not moved yet. And the big issue is this you know, circulation that has stopped there. So how do we start, you know, treating this? So we see this limp, we see this stiffness, this decreased range of motion, and then we do that x-ray just to look and we can see the fuzzy haze on that femoral head. And we'll treat this by um, putting, usually these kids will go on one of those tractions, that's Buck's traction, which will hold it stiff, and they're going to be on bed rest, okay? No weight bearing at all, and NSAIDs are the drug of choice for this. And then usually in time, these children, you know, they'll be okay with it, but it's the rest is what helps it heal. Now I'm going to go into three different spinal cord um, curvatures. Kyphosis is when we have basically what we call a humpback. You know, it's that upper thoracic spine that gets this big angle on it. Lordosis is the lumbar spine gets curved and you'll see that big exaggerated curve. And um, again, these sort of diagnoses and finding them in children, physical therapy is our biggest treatment with it. Now scoliosis is a S-shaped curvature of the spine. And, you know, in itself to have a little bit of curvature, you know, everybody has a slight something. Now, if it goes more than 45 degrees of curve, they will need to fix these children because you basically, this curve is compressing one of the lungs and we don't want to decrease, you know, um, any sort of lung capacity here. Now with uh, scoliosis, one shoulder will be higher than the other. And we could see that. And it usually happens with that pre-adolescent growth spurt. Remember they gain uh, 20 to 25% of their total height during this two um, year period. So um, this is scoliosis when you will see it. So this is your young adolescent. How do we treat this? Well, remember adolescents are into body image, okay? These children, these adolescents need to wear a brace 23 hours a day, 23 hours a day, only take it again off for showering with exercise, physical therapy. Many times, if it's less than this 40 degrees or 45 degrees, I mean, it has to be way up there. Um, usually if it's less than that, we can correct it um, with wearing this brace. These children, if we make it into a funky brace with different colors, like, you know, this leopard one and purple, it's less of a, you know, eyesore for these children. It just, you know, makes it more fun because, you know, they don't want everybody to see that they're different and wearing this brace. Now, if it's over this, they're going to have to do surgery. And what they do is what we call Harrington rods or Lukey rods. They'll take your spinal column and they'll attach a rod to different points on the spinal um, canal, okay? One on one side and the other, trying to hold that um, spinal uh, column as straight as we possibly can. And it doesn't have a complete fix, but it's gonna be a lot better than what it was. Osteomyelitis is an infection of a bone. This could be you stepped on something, you had an open, you know, sore on your foot and now on your big toe and now your big toe has osteomyelitis. Well, what would you see? Well, you usually see pain. Um, you're going to see redness, swelling, um, and these children get fever pretty quickly. And with the fever comes the chills because it's this infection that's getting in there. Usually it's a staphylococcus. So you were going to see elevated white counts, leukocytosis, and we're going to be doing a uh, bone culture because, again, we want to know what was the, um, the bacteria and how to treat it the best. So these children who come in with osteomyelitis, 
this is something that we need to take very seriously because it's internal. It could go to overwhelming sepsis if we don't. So we need very quick, prompt, vigorous IV antibiotics. And it could be three, four weeks or several months, depending on the severity of the osteo. Now, osteomyelitis, I said, are many times staph infections. Staph infections usually get the aminoglucosides like vancomycin, the CIN drugs. Remember these drugs, the aminoglucosides are very toxic to your kidneys and to hearing. So one of the things with getting these sort of drugs um, that we monitor their levels to make sure that they are appropriate and not too high so that we can save their kidneys and their hearing. And to be cognizant of the fact to decrease urine output, ringing in the ears, it's the antibiotic. Um, and we need to teach the parents and these children this too, so that we can make sure that they are getting um, quicker you know, uh, help and getting off those antibiotics as quick as we can to change it to something else. Now, what sort of diet do we use for these children? Well, you're talking about bone and muscle. So these children need a good protein diet with carbohydrates and um, this can help them heal better. Ewing sarcoma is a tumor, but it's a tumor of a bone. Now we've seen, you know, the osteosarcoma in, um, you know, the femur. Well, this is a different one that arises and it's, you can see the scapula on that girl, that whole thing is a bone thing. Um, it could be the jaws, um, could be any ribs, skull, scapula, vertebrae, pelvis. And what they need to do with these children is radiation, shrink it, um, chemotherapy, and then surgical resection if possible. So, and if we catch it before it metastasizes, it's the best thing. Rhabdomyosarcoma, you think myo, think muscle, anything from muscle, tendon, bursa, the gums, the eyes, the ears, all of these things, you'll see a, a lump there that shouldn't be there. And again, we need to get it out as soon as we can, but we shrink it, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, and rhabdomyosarcomas need a long-term chemo, up to two years. Juvenile idiopathic arthritis, JIA. This is when the body attacks the joints. Your immune system says, you know, joints, you know, let me go attack you because that's what my body's telling me to do. And you do see children with um, JIA. And what we'll usually see is these children will all of a sudden have a limp, okay? Um, and you're gonna see them in the morning stiffer than usual. And um, sometimes you'll see joint swelling a lot if it goes on, but that usually when you see that morning uh, stiffness and the limping, they're gonna suspect. There's also called uveitis where the eyes get all red and these children do need um, yearly eye exams. Now, JIA is extremely difficult to diagnose. Now I have, adult rheumatoid arthritis. It took them eight years to diagnose me, eight years in order for me to get on therapy and I'm still not on one that helps yet. So it's a very frustrating diagnosis. Can you imagine your, your child's hurting and the parents are doing everything right and still they're not figuring it out. So you will see elevated, you know, inflammatory factors, which is your SED rate, which is your C-reactive protein. You might see elevated white count with leukocytosis. You might see these things, but you may not. Positive ANAs, positive RA factors, negative. They could go either way. So it's so difficult. Now, all right, we've decided, yes, you have JIA to this child. So what is our goal? Well, we want to preserve function and prevent those deformities because juvenile idiopathic arthritis can really um, make those joints, you know, go and get extremely um, deformed. So it's NSAIDs is the drug of choice for pain. And then we'll put them on in an initial phase of pain 
corticosteroids. It helps decrease that inflammation. We'll put them on some methotrexate and then maybe Humira or Embril or Simsia or one of those other biologic type agents. And hopefully that keeps the pain at bay. And again, let these children be children. They need to get up, they need to move, they need to exercise because exercise keeps those joints moving. So physical therapy, occupational therapy, um, heat or cold, because I don't put heat on me, it hurts more, but cold and exercise and give those children some support. I mean, me, I'm in the pool every day I possibly can. And that's how I exercise. Children, they'll do all sorts of things. You put them in gymnastics, you put them in ballet, whatever. And, and this is a great thing for them. Now, lupus erythematosus is the body's immune system attacking organs. So any organs it can attack. Now, there usually is a familiar tendency for it. This is usually your late school age and adolescent girls where we start to see it. Most of the time we'll see that little red rash um, will be part of it. It could be um, at that 10 years old is where they start to go, you know, through, you know, puberty. And that could be that hormonal imbalance that sort of triggers it. But it could be many things, infections and stress and chemical that can cause it. Also, overexposure to sunlight. Children with lupus must wear sunscreens and you must limit their exposure to sun. You'll see all different sorts of rashes. Um, sometimes children, we don't catch it at first, but then we'll start seeing this forgetfulness. We'll start seeing this paralysis, you know, and maybe to the point of pericarditis. Um, and then of course, if it's hitting the kidneys, proteinuria. So, how do we treat this? Well, this is a steroid treated disease, plus there's other medications that can be there. Of course, NSAIDs for pain. And let these children be children, but again, be careful with sunlight with those kids. So Kristen is a 10 year old sustained a fracture in the epiphyseal plate of her right fibula when she fell out of a tree. When discussing this injury with her parents, the nurse should consider what? What is an epiphyseal plate? Bone growth, be, bone growth can be affected by this type of fracture. Absolutely. So again, we want to get that bone straight so that bone does grow straight. Thank you very much. Yes, very good. So neuromuscular and muscular dysfunction. You think cerebral palsy. Cerebral palsy is a disorder where you see these movements and postures that just, you know, aren't um, normal, as in they can't control their muscles um, as well as they could. 15 to 60% of these children with cerebral palsy also have epilepsy. So it's a dual type of combination. Now, why? Why do we have cerebral palsy? Well, it could be because the brain had abnormalities in it. Um, or how about those intraventricular hemorrhages due to those very fragile brains and vessels in there? It could cause it. Could be an occlusion, lack of oxygen, low birth weight. I've seen cerebral palsy being caused because infants get stuck in the birth canal can't get out, they rush for C-section, but by that point, they've had a hypoxic and anoxic episode, and they end up with various degrees of cerebral palsy. So, you know, there's all different reasons and, and some we don't even know. So how do we do diagnose this? Well, you know, it's that neurological examination and looking for the history, what's happened. But when we see a child, this spastic cerebral palsy, you're going to see that hypertonicity, poor posture, and difficulty gaining balance as they get older. These children, many of them will never walk without maybe a walker, you know, and if they get to the walker, that's where we want them to be. Um, infants, we just have to see, are they doing the fine motor skills? Are they doing it or their delay? Gross motor skills. That's why we look at those things. Are they able to grasp on to rattles? Are they able to roll over? 
If they're not, that's when you start looking what's happened and asking that history, was it a delay in birth or is there any other history that we need to know about? And we'll always do metabolic genetics testing. It could be a metabolic condition or it could be something passed down. So as I said, these children, gross motor delay, they just have that hypertonicity. They're unable to function and to stand up and to hold themselves. So they'll have that alteration in that muscle tone. They're not going to be able to sit normally, stand properly, you know, and um, all of these things go into cerebral palsy. So what is our goal? Well, we want these kids to be able to have some sort of ability to move, you know, whether it's in a wheelchair or if you look at this boy here, he has some form of cerebral palsy. He's got splints on his legs. They gave him a bike, let him ride around. Why not? You know, this kid feels good about himself, you know, and riding a bike, what is he doing? He's exercising. So it is a great thing. Any of these defects that we see that we can correct, we need to fix. And we need these kids to be placed in uh, places where they're getting, you know, other children around them. I mean, our goal with any sort of child with any disabilities is try to put them in, you know, mainstream schools, you know, with, you know, maybe a little different work, but get these children to, you know, try to be as much as they can be and then more. You know, years ago, we would just, you know, treat these kids and not educate them some of the severe cerebral palsy. But today, we are seeing these children are smarter and know more than you think they do. You know, I have my little Jonathan. He's from my um, daycare, this pediatric special needs daycare that I did clinicals at. And little Jonathan, severe cerebral palsy, severe specific spasticity. He'd look at me, the smile would go from ear to ear and his hands and he would just shake. He just wanted to give me a hug so quickly. Now, this kid is nonverbal, doesn't talk, but they gave him this little computer and he now even, it doesn't sound like a lot, but this kid knows shapes and he can tell you by pointing on this thing exactly what his needs are. And I think that's great. And they give him one goal. And once he makes that goal, he'll go for more. I've seen other children that was in wheelchairs that they exercise them, you know, physical occupational therapy, that they're up walking with walkers. So cerebral palsy is treated a lot differently than many years ago. They are letting them to be as much as they possibly can be. They will be with foot braces. They'll have orthopedic surgeries. My little guy did have uh, Botox injections and it was helping. They also put him on a levodopa carbidopa that would use in Parkinson's, right? That spas spasms and it was working. It was help relieving those tight spasms he was having. And one of the things is great dental hygiene because their mouths are always, um, you know, full of secretions and they can't handle them as well. So making sure that we keep those teeth as best as we can. And of course, the therapies. Prognosis, let me tell you, these children are doing more than they ever thought they could. We know that there are some severe ones that will never get to a certain level, but many, 85% can get up and walk, okay? And I think that's amazing. And these children usually die from complications, like they're in bed, you know, they're getting pneumonias and they, you know, get urosepsis. And that's usually what these children die from, not from cerebral palsy, but the complications. So those families are gonna need a lot of help, a lot of equipment, and um, they're gonna get medications. Um, again, keeping them safe, making sure that they're in a wheelchair, they're strapped in and they're in bed, that their side rails are up, all of those things so important. And they need to be up and out. And, you know, these recreational activities, they would take these children, put them on a bus and bring them to the zoo or bring them to a water park. Or one day they had the, the back um, area put little swimming pools and had kids with their feet in them and their hands and playing with them. And all of this stuff is so important. Keep that mind working, not just sit in a room because you have cerebral palsy. So maybe you don't understand because many of them do. And again, um, support that family. Now, neurotube deficits. Every year of folic acid, T 
take it one month before you're pregnant so you don't get neurotube deficits. And you were like, okay, you remembered neurotube deficits, but you didn't know what that meant. Well, neurotube deficits are when the spinal cord and meninges do not go inside the body. They're born on the outside, like gastroschisis, bladder extrophy. This is the lower back and it could be small and it could be large. And there's other ones, but we're gonna just talk about spina bifida and myelomeningocele. Now, this is usually due, um, it's at that last three to, this, that three to four weeks, right after these babies are um, conceived is when these things start happening. Um, it could be due to some mother problems as in obesity, diabetes, or low B12. So neurotube deficits, what are we going to do? We have this kid who has this spinal cord and meninges born on the outside of their back. Our goal is to get that and put it back inside the body so um, prevents infection. Now, if we have spinal cord outside and meninges outside, it's stretched nerves to get there, right? So you're gonna have decreased strength in those lower extremities, sometimes no strength at all. There's all different levels of it because you've literally torn those nerves to get it out there. You're gonna be monitoring bowel function, extremely important on these children um, because, and bowel and urine, they may not feel that they're full. They may not feel the need to stool or they're unable to push because they don't have nerves. So very important things that we look at. And these children at birth, no matter what, are made latex allergy because they're gonna need multiple surgeries. So again, folic acid, like I said, should be taken and this helps uh, prevent um, neurotube deficits. Wording Hoffman disease. This is now going into those um, dystrophies, those type of uh, syndromes that can occur due to muscle, um, that the muscles that don't work right, um, or an atrophy it's called. So Wurdig Hoffman is also called a floppy infant syndrome, which means they have absolutely no strength on any muscles. It is progressive, it gets worse. These children, unfortunately, do die before two years old. No muscles work, you know, diaphragm doesn't work. So usually they die from respiratory arrest. Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is just like Tetralogy of Fallot on your NCLEX. This is Duchenne muscular dystrophy is that um, type of muscular dystrophy that your exams love to talk about. These are usually males. They're usually ages three to seven, and it is inherited from mom, an X-linked inherited problem. These children all of a sudden start getting very weak. They start falling down and um, then their muscles don't work the way they should. So um, as they get older, the muscles in the body, they end up, they can't walk, their muscles in their legs don't work, their arms don't work that well, they can't feed themselves. So they progressively get more and more that we have to care for them. So as I said, the muscles aren't working, you know, even if the mind wants it, the muscles don't respond. You'll see them start to waddle, they'll fall. Another thing is this what called Gower sign. These children at a young age to get up, get up off the floor, walk up their, arm, their legs to get up. Like I do now as an old lady, you know, you're on the floor and you just take your arms and put it on your thighs to get yourself up. That's Gower sign. And then that curvature of that low spine, the lordosis. And then we are going to see again that um, muscle atrophy as it keeps going. Because they can't move, they're gonna be a little obese. They can't burn off calories. And these children do have a mild to moderate mental impairment. 
So there's really no treatment for it, but we need to keep these muscles moving as long as possible. So range of motion, bracing for these children. And if these parents want another child, they need genetic counseling because again, it comes from mom, X-Link. Guillain-Barre syndrome, it's a neuromuscular disorder and it is what we call an infectious polyneuritis. And what happens is the nerves um, get inflamed and it starts from the feet and you'll start seeing again, shuffling of the feet, falling down and it starts going up the body and it, then you'll see urine incontinence, maybe constipation, and then it gets to the diaphragm and the nerve stops working and it's respiratory arrest, okay? You do see it in children. It's not that common, but I've seen it ages four to 10. So what happens after we see all of this paralysis from the feet going all the way up? You usually will see a, um, this disorder after an upper respiratory infection. Again, that upper respiratory infection can cause things, you know, many things we've been discussing. So you have a child that we've diagnosed, Gillian Barre, it's gone to the diaphragm, they're on a ventilator. These children need extremely close respiratory effort. Now, if they haven't gotten to the point of diaphragm yet, we are going to be monitoring because it will affect their diaphragm most of the time. So monitoring their respiratory status, what the breath sounds are, their O2 saturations. Now, how do we treat it? Well, IV, Ig, intravenous immunoglobins is number one. Um, they're saying maybe steroids and then this plasmapheresis where we take out the um, components in the blood that we feel are causing these sort of things. You know, and then again, we are paralyzed from the you know, chest down, preventing those complications. Tetanus, stepping on that rusty nail, right? So you get your tetanus shot. Now we do do tetanus shots every 10 years. And um, they're actually putting a the diphtheria in with it. So it's a tetanus diphtheria shot today, it used to be just tetanus. And tetanus is a horrible disease. It's where the muscles go into spasm. Can you imagine having a cramp that doesn't go away and multiply that by a hundred? Ever get a cramp in your leg and it wakes you up at night and you have to get up and walk and move that leg because it hurts so bad? Well, usually this is in the jaw, okay? So muscle spasm in the jaw and it gets worse and worse and worse. Extremely painful, okay? So you will see this child all of a sudden, sometimes the diagnosis, you're going to see them, they can't open their mouth, you might see the spasms in their jaws, they can't swallow, and you know, this is going to be this clue. <clears throat> so you're going to see with these children, their respiratory status, because they're all swollen, all stiff, all of this is uh, swelled up, they're going to go probably into atelectasis, pneumonia, and respiratory um, arrest. Now, these children, if most of them can die if they don't get treatment right away. If we can get them four days out by giving them this tetanus toxoid vaccine, we can probably save them. But this child is all gonna be this tight muscle respiratory issue. Um, these children, again, rapid heart rate is painful. Diaphoresis, same thing, whether they have a fever or not. And they're going to be intubated. They are going to be um, uh, treated with muscle relaxants. So we're going to give these children um, to prevent this, this tetani tetanus toxoid or antitoxin. I've seen them inject the round wounds and then give a booster. Um, again, you know, if you get a wound on the foot, the arm, wherever, where this puncture wound is, wash it with soap and water. Soap and water is the best thing. And even frostbite can include um, these things from going on. So again, tetanus toxoid, again, we can put it right in that area. So these children are in intensive care. 
these children um, will be on paralytic agents. You know, they call them muscle relaxants, but this is, we're gonna paralyze them, pavulon, so they can't move, trying to decrease that muscle from spasming. And we're gonna be putting them on really high sedatives to keep them asleep because it is painful and we don't want those muscles working against them breathing well. So monitor eyes and O's. We're gonna give that tetanus immune globin and of course wound care to wherever that wound is where the tetanus came in. Is it, uh, is it calcium gluconate, the one they put on for tetanus? Calcium gluconate, calcium works with the muscles, no. Um, they're just gonna give the tetanus um, uh, toxoid for these children. And we're going to just put them on a ventilator and paralyze the date them. And hopefully, hopefully, you know, the wound care, they have a wound in there, it's tetanus, giving them that the uh, toxoid therapy, hopefully it will turn around. They'll do, you know, antibiotics and all other different things to just try. But these children are extremely, extremely sick, extremely ill. So botulism, ever have your grandma say your child, your child has constipation, so give them a little honey, give them a little Cairo syrup that's going to help them move their bowels. Never do it again. Because you don't know when that honey or caro syrup, which is that lighter dark corn syrup, was bottled, and if it was bottled sterilely. And botulism goes in that honey. So don't give these children honey, especially as an infant, because botulism, again, you become extremely ill. You know, older children could be, again, you know, that sterilized home canned foods. I mean, in New York, we used to always take our tomatoes and, and, you know, we would bottle them and put them up for the winter, you know, but, you know, as long as it was done properly, those bottles were sterilized, et cetera, it was okay, but it can be a bad thing. So what happens? You take the honey, you give it to the kid, they move their bowels. Okay, everything's good. 12 to 36 hours later, you're going to see this child start to vomit. If they're old enough to tell you, you know, headache. Uh, but remember, infants can't tell you that. But you're going to see them start and having difficulty breathing. The vomiting, difficulty breathing usually brings them in. How do we treat this one? Well, again, it's an IV botulism immunoglobin. And again, it's respiratory issue. We're going to monitor their respiratory status. And um, there is this paralysis that occurs with it. So um, waiting until that paralysis turns around and always any child who is ill, you know, on a ventilator who cannot eat, still getting proper nutrition will always be our priority. Now, spinal cord injuries. Spinal cord injuries, usually if you look at them, motor vehicle accidents can cause it. You know, I have a story of a 16 year old with a sports injury. I was the primary trauma nurse on, which means I'm in charge of any kid who came in in trauma that day. 16 year old came in, slid into third base, his head hit the knee of the defender sliding into third base and everybody heard a crack. And immediately this child had weakness in the lower extremities. So they knew not to touch him. They called rescue, they got them all you know, with the neck brace, put him on the backboard and they airlifted him to my hospital. He came in and we put him on the stretcher, still on the board, and the right leg was numb and the left leg he could barely feel, okay? Now, my job is to keep that child from getting worse, right? So, I mean, just like with birth, you're having a child coming out of the birth canal and you're pulling on that neck it can have spinal cord injuries. So you have to be very careful. How about the coup de co, which is hyperflexion, um, hyper hypoflexion of the neck in a car crash, your head goes back and forth. Those things are neck injuries too. So our goal in spinal cord therapy is to keep that um, neck or low back or spinal cord 
immobile. Do not let anybody move them unless it's under your care, okay? So turning this kid side to side, it will be on my count. You have here and here, and we do it in one thing. Keeping that neck brace on until we can get it cleared. This child that I'm talking about had a C5, C6 angulated fracture. So your spinal column is supposed to be straight. His was angled almost like a little teepee. It was really severe. So they decided, which is not done often, but to do a, an MRI from the emergency room. So I went with that child because nobody was gonna touch him without me. And I had to get him from that board, off the board, onto the MRI stretcher, into the MRI, then back on and back over to the um, emergency room. So it took a lot. Now, this child ended up going to the ICU. We put him on a cooling pad because we don't want swelling to occur. We put him on sedation and we put the tongs in his head to hold his head straight. And he went to surgery the next day because that was a Sunday. They did him Monday morning when some of the swelling could go down. Two weeks later, I went to visit him. He was moving everything, slight, slight numbness in the left foot, and he was going to therapy. Came back to me a year later, and the kid was perfect. And why? Because a nurse paid attention and didn't let anything happen to that neck. So you see how important nurses are. It takes the whole team, but it took one person that could have moved that kid wrong, and it would have been the end of his functionality. So a progressive infantile spinal muscular atrophy, which is called floppy infant, is which one? Is wording Hoffman. I won't put you through it. <laughs> so those are my stories for today. Um, we're going to go do our cahoots. Who wants to win today? Jessica, it's your turn. Maybe. Brianna, your turn. Yeah, Ulysses. Is everybody with me or are you hiding behind your names? Tina, you there? Alexis, Ashlyn, April, Hassan, you there? Nikki, here. I'm here. Lauren, Crystal? I'm here. I think you have a helper there, Ulysses. <laughs> Somebody needs a hug and a love. Muscular skeletal neuromuscular dysfunction. What is the priority for a nurse to assess following a cast application? Priority. So everything, you know, you talk about those six P's, very important concept to remember. So six P's, we are going to watch pulses, pain, movement, and sensation, all of it. What should the nurse monitor after a soft tissue injury? You have a big old ecumenic injury or you have a crush injury with bruising. What's the big thing that you need to watch? And those are the neurovascular signs 
Remember that swelling could be more inside, you can't see, and it could swell and it could occlude a vessel, a blood vessel, and you don't get blood flow. So neurovascular signs are number one. A fracture that penetrates the skin is called what? It's called compound fracture, yes. And that's the one we have to worry about infection and IV antibiotics as a therapy. What is priority nursing care for a child who fell off the second floor balcony? So, Whenever you have an injury, whether the kid doesn't complain of pain anywhere, they've had a sustainable fall, uh, fall, always protect that spine. You never know. And it's better to be safe than to be sorry. Principles of managing soft tissue injuries include what? And that's rice, your rest, ice, compress, and elevate. Yes, very good. Epiphyseal plate fractures in children may what? And of course, it will disrupt the growth of bones. They could be crooked, the leg could be shorter, the arm could be shorter. So we need to be very careful, careful with those growth plates to make sure that they are straight and aligned. What findings for a patient in skeletal traction indicate peripheral neurovascular impairment? So when you have neurovascular impairment, it means there's no pulses, there are neurovascular signs, prolonged capillary refills or none, pale feet or hands, whatever. How should the nurse care for the skeletal traction for a child with a fractured femur? <clears throat> A skeletal traction is when you use pins that are inserted into the leg. They used to use diamond pins for fractured femurs, um, but now we do the surgery with the rod. Now we just put them in Buck's traction. But whenever you're talking traction, always make sure if there's weights on there, that traction, that they be free hanging, no obstructions, um, because that's what's keeping that bone straight, okay? When caring for a nine-year-old in Buck's traction, what action by the nurse is correct? So when you're in traction, that means there's some sort of something that's gone on and your concern with any orthopedic type injury is neurovascular and pulses. So check capillary refill. A multi-select. Which assessment indicates an infant has developmental dysplasia of the hip? So the moro is that scare reflex where their hands go up when you make a noise or hit the crib. Babinski is the bottom of the foot. It has nothing to do with developmental dysplasia. It's positive ortolani and those asymmetrical leg folds or gluteal folds. It means they're crooked and that short leg too, right? And that clicking of the hip, you can hear it. 
which statements by parents indicate more teaching is needed regarding their two month old with club foot. They need more teaching. So this is this condition where we have casting, that Ponsetti method's going on, and it must be done every week. You do not want to wait for a month. That could cause other problems, and they need to redo the cast every week to get that foot where it needs to go. Remember, infants, it's two to four weeks. They're completely healed, two to three weeks, right? So you wait for a month, you, you have a problem now. So every week they should come and you need to start this as soon as possible. A multi-select. Osteogenesis imperfecta. So osteogenesis imperfecta is a dominant gene that's there, but it's also called brittle bone disease. We will never do aggressive physical therapy, no physical therapy at all. There's actually been cases that uh, parents have been accused of child abuse when their children had not been diagnosed with osteogenesis imperfecta because of the amount of fractures that were seen. So child abuse, this is one of the things that these parents are concerned about if it wasn't, or, or they didn't know that they had it. When can osteogenesis imperfecta be the most life-threatening? <clears throat> So if we didn't know they had OI and they're coming through the birth canal and then we're pulling them out, literally, we could be fracturing all their bones. So during birth is uh, that problem that is the most life-threatening. What is the pathologic cause of leg calf birth disease? And if you look at that femoral head on the right, you see how it's fuzzy on top? that's where they see that aseptic necrosis going on. And it is, it's ischemic, it's ischemic asepsis, necrosis of the femoral head. It means there is no blood supply going to the femoral head and it's just dying. And we need to what, bed rest and SEDS and maybe some traction on that leg to help. What is kyphosis? Kyphosis is that humpback. Yes, it is. Lordosis is described as And that's that uh, spine on the lumbar that just goes in really exaggerated. And we see that with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Scoliosis is. So that is the S-shape, scoliosis, that S-shape. And we know if it's more than 40, 45% uh, curvature needs surgery. If not, it is a brace 23 hours a day with physical therapy. 
Adolescents with scoliosis have a 25% curvature of the spine would need to do what? And that's where that breaks, 23 hours a day. Good. What is osteomyelitis? And that's an inflammatory condition of a bone caused by an infection. Treatment is going to be those IV antibiotics for long term, maybe one month or more. And of course, making sure that during that time, we're monitoring those drug levels to prevent um, any complications. Juvenile rheumatoid arthritis is a and what? And that's the inflammatory disorder of the synovial joints. It means your immune system attacks the joints. <clears throat> Goals for juvenile idiopathic arthritis include what? So we wanna reduce the joint pain and swelling because we want them to be as independent as possible. Exercise again in NSAIDs. Systemic lupus erythematosus is? It's an autoimmune disease, the body attacks organs, yes. Multi-select. What can help a child with lupus erythematosus prevent its aspirations? So sunlight bothers children and adults with lupus. They should be wearing sunscreen and decrease that exposure and antibiotics and steroids before as in a prophylactic before procedures like dental. It has nothing to do with diet. What organs can lupus affect? Anything, if it's an organ, heart, lungs, kidney, liver, brain, skin, anything. It's non-discriminating. What is cerebral palsy? So cerebral palsy is about, um, it affects the muscles and the nerves, which is the body movement and the muscle coordination. Also, you know, affects their, their, men, their mentation to their, you know, um, are they alert? You know, are they delayed? Many of them are delayed. A myelomeningocele. So myelomeningocele is a hernia, the spinal cord and meninges come out of the lower back. You know, our first goal is prevent infections on that. And then of course, because that stretching of those nerves, because it's on the outside, monitoring bowel and urine is very important. Infants with myelomeningocele demonstrate what?
It's motor and sensory impairments of the lower extremities. Some children can move a little bit. Some, pe some infants can feel a little bit. And it's at all different degrees, depending on how big the myeloma was. Due to decreased motors and sensation in the lower extremities, what must the nurse monitor closely? <clears throat> and a myelomeningocele. So when we stretch those nerves, of course, you're gonna have those decreased motor and sensations to lower extremities, but that nerve to the bladder, the nerve to the bowels, are they there? So we really must monitor for urinary retention. Many of these children end up having every four hour catheterizations for life because they don't feel it at all. A key feature of Duchenne muscular dystrophy is what? <laughs> So muscular dystrophy, progressive muscle wasting. Remember, it starts with kid waddling, uh, gower sign, walking up themselves to stand up, shuffling. And that's what starts them into uh, finding out what's going on. What is one of the procedures that a child with possible Duchenne may need to diagnose this condition? Now remember, Duchenne is all about muscle and muscle wasting. How are we going to figure that out? You have all of the symptoms, the waddling, you have that, you know, Gower sign. It's called an electromyography. And what they do is they take these little electrodes and put it on their arms and legs and they shoot a current and they look at the way the body uh, responds to it let you know that it hurts, okay? Those nerves get um, um, hit with this little shock and it tends to hurt. So let the parent know that this child may need some Motrin or Tylenol or something when they come back from that. And it's absolutely normal and the pain will go away. How is Duchenne muscular dystrophy inherited? It's an X-link recessive pattern. Remember, it comes from mom. In caring for a patient with Gillian Barre, the priority concern is what? So remember Gillian Barre, it's that nerves inflammation. It starts from the feet and it goes up and then it hits the diaphragm, the phrenic nerve. So we're always concerned airway, airway, airway. Very good. For a patient suffering with Gillian Barre, they would complain of weakness. That was what? So it goes from the feet and work up, and that is called ascending. When it comes from the head down, it's descending. From the feet up is ascending. Great. A multi-select. Treatment for Gillian Barre include... So IVIG for sure, respiratory support, maybe steroids. Now, this is a viral type of disease. So 
antibiotics are not going to do anything. And heparin, they don't use heparin for this. Maybe a low molecular weight to prevent DVT, but that's not the treatment for Gillian Barre. It's for complications possibly of because of the bed rest. What type of cerebral palsy causes hypertonicity and poor fine motor skills? And it's called spastic cerebral palsy, spastic hypertonicity. When you, it's like a spasm, think spasm and hypertonicity. It's like really. What priority action should a nurse take to a patient with a suspected spinal cord injury? And that's, please make sure that spine's immobilized and do everything you can to protect that spine. Just like I did with that young boy who turned out great. You should get a tetanus shot every how many years? And it's every 10 years. You know, when I first started, I think it was um, every five years and now it's every 10 years. Which is a symptom of tetanus? And that's locked jaw. It's that tetanus, it's muscle spasms of the jaw and the neck. And last question, most common causes of spinal cord injuries are? And that's motor vehicle, driving, sports. Yes, absolutely. Good job, guys. Number three, Mike, good job, Mike. Number two. Ulysses, yep, you were fighting the whole game to win. Number one, Alexis, good job. Number four, Brianna and Lauren, good job, guys. Please sign your attendance attestation so you get those done and don't forget. Remember, please be checking your projects in case you want to get more points, and I'll be doing those so that you can check on them, okay? Any questions at all? Thank you, everybody. Have a good day. Thank you. Bye, Professor. Bye.